Cornerstone Chapel, how are you doing today? Can you believe that it's already June? Whew. Kids just got out of school last week, right? Summer break. How are we doing, parents? <laughs> Hang in there. You only have nine or ten or twelve more weeks to go, whatever it is. You'll be all right. Well, hey, we just want to welcome those who are online joining us. Uh, so blessed to have you here. I'm Pastor Mike. Uh, I'm on staff here at Cornerstone, I, and I just so honored to be up here, uh, being able to give the word today. Uh, so grateful that Pastor Mark gives all of the staff this opportunity uh, to be able to do this. Um, as far as Pastor Mark and Deb, just sort of a real quick, they are uh, actually back in town. So uh, they were at Florida for the first week of the uh, first several weeks of sabbatical, and then just last week they were at the Foursquare Convention in Tennessee, and they are back in town. So if you happen to see like a Pastor Mark and Deb sighting, you know, like a Bigfoot thing, take a picture. Don't get too close. They've been in the wild for far too long. Approach slowly, but no, they would really, they really would love to be able to talk to you and see you there. Um, so uh, if you do see them, just stop and say hi. However, they do have a, a video that we're going to show here real, real quick, uh, just kind of catch up on speed, what's been going on with them. So look up to the screens. Hey, what's up, Cornerstone family? Mark and Deb here with another sabbatical update. Hi, everyone. It's wonderful to greet you again today. Our sabbatical is still going really well. We can't believe how fast it's going. We're more than halfway done. Yeah, and we're actually in Nashville, Tennessee this week at our annual International Foursquare Convention. Um, we belong to an amazing denomination called Foursquare. And uh, this week, um, there's over 4,000 people from our Foursquare family uh, from right here in the U.S. and really all around the world. And um, we've been able to vote in a brand new president of our movement. And uh, also just hearing all the amazing things that God is doing in our Foursquare family. Man, many of you know Pastor Larry, who is very instrumental in coaching us in this sabbatical. We had a chance to sit down with him, and it was so encouraging. He said something to me that really uh, struck a chord, and it really reminded me of something I wanted to share with you. He said, Mark, don't forget that um, God is doing a new thing in you during this sabbatical, but not only in you, but also in your entire congregation. And I just wanted you guys to hear that. Not only is God doing a new thing in Deb and I as we step away for a few weeks, but you guys, uh, we need to know that God is doing a brand new thing in our whole church, in our congregation. And man, that's just exciting. You know, the Bible says in Isaiah, it says, forget the former things, do not dwell on on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up on you. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. So just like our church uh, during Project Impact is really getting a, a new look um, with fresh coat of paint and uh, coming up in a few weeks, new chairs and new flooring, um, we have to know that that's kind of a picture of what God's doing in our lives as well and yours as well. And uh, so God's doing a new thing also in our leaders. And I, with that said, I want to give a shout out to um, our leadership, Pastor Rob for continuing our series on being a church on mission and bringing the word through the entire month of May, man. Man, uh, great job. And for the month of June, you're going to be hearing from the rest of our pastoral staff, uh, Nick and Rusty and Melanie and Nate and today, Pastor Mike. So, man, it's exciting. Um, we love you guys. We miss you. Um, we're praying for you. Continue to pray for us um, that God is doing this new thing in all of us. Man, let's expect it, believe it, receive it. And, um, man, we love you guys. Love Knock you. it out of the park, guys. See ya. Bye. All right. They look very tan, don't they? <laughs> very refreshed, very relaxed, very tan. So happy for them. Um, just want to let you know, too, that if, uh, if you want to put together like a, a, a note of encouragement or just a little card for them so that when they get back in a month, um, we could just put that on their desk uh, just to let them know how much we love them and miss them and, and glad to have them back. So if, if, if you want to do that, just uh, you can actually take that to the information center, drop it off on a Sunday through the month of June, or you can even drop it off at, uh, in the office at any time during the week, and we'll take care of that. So for the last month, uh, we've been talking about the church in and through us. And so for the last four weeks, Pastor Rodney has been talking about the church in us. So helping us to deal with some stuff that we have going on in our own lives. So bitterness and struggles that we have and so forth. And so for the next four months, we're going to talk about the church through us. And I really believe um, that one of the things that God really wants us to truly understand is the need for discipleship. And that's what we're going to focus on this morning. But let me ask you this. Um, what is, the, what is the church? 
Who said us? Us. Give it up for Frank. Us. All right. And give it up for anybody else who had that thought. Us. We are the church. The church is not just a building. The church is you and me. So if we didn't have a place to gather, we could still have church, right? Right on. So I really feel like if there was two things that we could really change within our, our Christian cultural context is the word church. Because so many people think it's just a building. It's where we go. It's actually no. It's what we do. We are the church. Worship is another word where I think it's just funky. Worship is what we did for 20 minutes here a few minutes ago, but worship is really our lifestyle and what God has called us to do um, all day long. So, so if we are the church and we are called to, to disciple, what, is, what does discipleship even mean? What is discipleship? Any, any takers on that? What was that? Teaching other people to follow Jesus. I love that. Give it up for whoever was over there. Yeah, that's great. Teaching others to follow Jesus, um, essentially. So a, a, a disciple is essentially a follower of a teacher or a philosopher or a leader. And so we, within the church here, our teacher is Jesus. He is our master. He is our Lord. He, he is the one that we serve. So in everything that we do in our lives, we want to make sure that our lives look like the one that we're following. So why do we need discipleship? Why does it need to happen? To grow. I love that one. I'll take that one. What else? How about so the next generation will know, right? So as we focus on discipleship, we're going to focus on four ways that we can develop a heart for discipleship today. And it's going to be four words that begin with the letter P, plan, place, perspective, and passion. So we're going to talk about plan first. So Matthew 28 says this, and it's a very familiar verse. This is Jesus' last words before he ascends into heaven. Um, he's speaking this to, this to the disciples, and he says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very ends of the age. Now, some people might argue saying that this word right here was really specifically meant for the disciples, the 11 disciples. Because if you go back into um, verse 16, Jesus is talking to just the 11th. Because Judas, the 12th, he has already kind of gone and out of the picture so he's he's talking to the 11 disciples who are remaining and he goes off and some people could argue that it was really for those disciples to go out and and disciple the nations and baptize in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit however that doesn't stand very strongly because there has been other nations that have come up obviously throughout the centuries so we have more nations we have more people and then jesus finishes that by saying and surely i am with you always to the very ends of the age so obviously we don't have any of the original disciples here. And so Jesus is still with who? He's with us, right? He's with us so that we can go forth and make disciples, so on and so forth as time goes on. So here's the deal. I truly believe that it is God's plan for your life to make disciples. That whatever you are at in life, it is his plan that you make disciples where you are. Now, what if you say, hey, Mike, come on, but you got to understand, I don't like people. <laughs> Close your eyes real quick. I'm just curious. Close your eyes. Raise your hand if you just don't like people. <laughs> ah! Way more than first service. Okay, I'm just saying. Right on. All right. Well, to that, I just say you're going to have to get over that, all right? You got to work through that because if we're supposed to be like the one we're following, Jesus, who loves people, then we need to find a little bit of place in our heart to love people as well. Now, what if you're introverted? Like, I'm, I'm definitely way more of an introvert. I like to pull back and just kind of relax and stuff and not always be in big groups and stuff. And so even if you're an introvert and you don't necessarily like being around people, there's still a way that you still can disciple and are called to disciple. Well, what if you're too busy? Well, work on that one, all right? Because again, this is a big deal. Like these are Jesus' last words before he ascends into heaven to go and make disciples. And so we know that one day we're gonna stand before him and we'll be accountable for what we did with what he gave us. 
And that's a scary thought. It can be a scary thought. And so when he asks, you know, what we did with it, he gave us, we, we, we want to be able to say that we've been faithful with that, right? And that we weren't too busy with our stuff to take care of the command that he put on our hearts. So really, not really many of us are exempt from this call to go and make disciples. So the first one is plan. Help, so I want you to understand that it is God's plan for all of us to go and make disciples. Now that's going to look differently for everybody. So let's talk about number two, which is place. Everybody is at a different place in our lives. We get that, right? Have you ever thought, though, that you were created for such a time as this? That God has you in June 2019 at Cornerstone Chapel really early in the morning. God knew that. God planned that. God wanted you here. You ever think that the place where you live, the, the development that you live in, the, uh, the city that you live in, the, your job, the school that you go to, God has orchestrated all that and he put you here for such a time as this. So we're going to open up to Matthew 25. And it's going to be kind of a lengthy portion of scripture. It's not going to be up on the screen. Uh, you could grab a Bible from the seat back in front of you if you don't have one or just go to your Bible app. And we're going to get into this. So I'll give you a second just to get there. So as you're turning there, I'll go ahead and explain. Um, depends on what translation you have. Uh, mine says bags of gold. Uh, a man has given bags of gold to his servants. Your, yours may say talent. And let me just explain real quick what a talent is. A talent is, um, in Jewish uh, currency of the day, a talent was... 20 years worth of wages. So it's a lot of money. So as we go through this, I want you to just kind of carry that and just, uh, um, yeah, let's go ahead and read. So Matthew 25, verse 14 says this. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money at work and gained five more bags. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled his accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seeds. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well then. You should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the gold of money, uh, the bag of gold from him and give it to him who has 10 bags. For whoever has will be given more, for they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have even what they have will be taken from them. And now throw this worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, this is not ne about talents necessarily as far as skills and everything that we have. It's talking about what is valuable. So obviously when we, when we hear that large sum of money, 20 years wages is one talent. Some had five, some had two, some had one. This man who went on this journey, he had a lot of money. He was set. And so we, we also understand too that, that Jesus isn't talking about money. He's really talking about what's valuable. So think about it real quick. What is valuable to God? Did I hear daddy? Yes. Daddy's valuable to God. Yes. Souls. Thank you. You and me, relationships, people, we are all valuable to God. 
And so when he's entrusting these people, these, these three men, with, with the money in the story, because when we, when we take out what this story is really talking about, the man who goes on the, the journey, well, this is Jesus. Jesus entrusts into his servants, his stewards, to take what he has given them, to use it, to, to build his kingdom, to go out and to, to give money to the poor, to love on the lost, to bring them into the fold. That, that's what we're talking about here. Jesus obviously was here and he left. One day he's going to come back and we will be standing in front of him, like I said earlier, accountable for what we've done with what he's given us. And so what he's saying is this precious thing that I've given you, this responsibility, this mission to go and make disciples, this is important, this is valuable, do something with it. Now, I also want to draw sort of another parallel here that we understand as we read through this that there was two men that took what, what was given to them and they used it for God's glory. So think for a second. Now, what have we been given? We've been given resources, right? Some have been given more money than others. Some has been, have been given talents and just abilities and skills and so forth. So this is what we're talking about here. And so it's now taking that and using it to build God's kingdom. Two men, they got this. And I hate to use this word here, but I will. You can almost say that they were sort of the true disciples. That they understood the message of the master and what he was saying. They understood the value of what they had been given and so they're going to go out and multiply it. And then you have the one guy who did nothing with what he was given. In fact, he, he really kind of misunderstood the master and really who he was. And so therefore, he didn't do anything with what was given to him. And we don't want to be like that guy. Now, here's another thing that I think that we need to draw from is this. Some people have been given more than others. Would you agree? So when you look at like the person with the five bags obviously this the the master was able to entrust more in that one person and what i think about when i when i when i think about this guy well this guy probably was someone who had a lot of resources maybe a lot of money maybe they were like super sick talented like like anything that they picked up just turned to gold um and i would just say too how many of you guys have ever known anybody like that like they're just super talented anything they do makes me want to just want to punch them in the face because it's like you know <laughs> Why do you have so much talent? Why are you so good at everything? But that's just the way it is. Some people just are good with everything. Other people, they may not have all of that talent over there. They're kind of like they can handle two bags. But that's okay because in God's economy, like, that doesn't really matter. He gave five to the one because he knew that one could, could handle the five. Then he gave two to the other because he knew that one could handle the two. The one could handle the one. So there's no, no sense of getting all involved in just like someone has more, whatever. That's not what, what matters. What matters is what you do with what you've been given. That's what matters. And so your place in life really has a lot to do with just where you are. So think for a second, what have you been given? What job are you at? What resources do you have? Where can you make a, an impact for God's kingdom where you are? Not about where necessarily you want to be or where other people are. And you may, may look and say, oh, that person is, they're super gifted, super talented, super fruitful. I want to be there. No, well, what, what do you have? What place are you at in life and what are you doing with what God has given you? And I would even say that sometimes this whole place thing has something to do with like our personalities as well. Because again, there are some people who can, they can just move and shake and do things. Other times, peop other people just really can't. And you got to be good with that. You got to be okay with, with what God has given you. And you got to rise to the occasion and use it for his glory. We make, does this make sense? Are we tracking? Are we good? Because I want to move on. Any questions? Right on. All right. So number three is perspective. And I want to spend some time here. Because I think this is really important. This is something that we need to get. Um, it was funny, about uh, probably two, three weeks ago or so, I was just doing some cleanup around the house and everything. And usually when I'm, when I'm cleaning, I like to listen to music because I love music. So I got Spotify and I got all my playlists laid out there on Spotify. And I just felt like today it was 70s soft rock. I needed to listen to some Jim Croce, some America, some ELO and stuff like that. 
And as I'm listening and just doing stuff around the house, uh, the Carpenters came on. And it's the song, Rainy Days and Mondays. You guys know that? <laughs> Rainy Days and Mondays. Can you hear the tune in your head right now? Well, I'll sing it for you. So the chorus it goes, hanging around, nothing to do but frown. Because rainy days and Mondays always get me down. Right? And so as I'm listening to that, thank you. I really put myself out there. All right. So as I'm listening to that song, and I'm listening to that chorus, I'm thinking to myself, well, you know what? I, I really actually kind of like rainy days. You know, I like the smell of rain, and I like the feel of rain, especially like when I've been working hard all week long, and I know Saturday is the day when i got to get stuff done, and I wake up and it's raining. It's like, yes, I don't have to work outside. So I love rainy days, and Monday's my day off, so it's like, I love that too. So I understand what Karen was saying in the song, but it's like, from my perspective, it's just a little... It's just a little different. And so I'm going to show you just a painting here that I just absolutely love. Had to break down and get it here recently um, because I'm going to use it as an illustration. But I also hangs in my office, which I love this. Has anybody ever seen this before? Called the Great Wave of Kanangawa or Under the Great Wave. Now, this painting was painted uh, by a guy named Kasushika Hukasai back in 1830s and 1833. So this was one painting of 36 different uh, views of Mount Fuji that he had produced. This is definitely the most popular out of all of these paintings. Um, quite possibly, debatably, the most uh, famous piece of art to come out of Japan. And so, as I said, this is uh, one of 36 different views, paintings, of Mount Fuji. And as you're looking at this thing, you may be saying, well, where is Mount Fuji? Because all I see is a wave. Mount Fuji is actually right down here. Kind of blends in with the color and everything. Super cool how he did all, did all that. And when I look at this painting, this is all about perspective. When we look at it. A lot of his paintings, Mount Fuji was just this massive mountain. And Mount Fuji itself, 12,000 feet tall, it is massive. But this one, he decided to go a different route and give a little bit of perspective. And you know what? As I was looking at this and thinking through about what perspective really means and how this can help us in making disciples, I realized that, you know, sometimes, sometimes we make the small things the big things and the big things the small things. You know what I mean? Like when you look at it from this perspective, this wave is huge. But when you go actually step back and if you were to actually stand on Mount Fuji and look down and see the water, well, that wave is really nothing. And I really believe that God is calling us to have more of a, a God perspective. Like to stand on the mountain, to look out around the landscape of just life and everything around us. We're supposed to have his perspective, not ours. Now, just some illustrations here. Um, think of just the little small irritations, the small little annoyances that we go through every day. Whether it's with the perfume that a coworker is wearing in the other cubicle that just ticks you off. Why are they going to wear that? You know? It's a little thing. It bothers you, yes. But in the grand scheme of life and what we're called to do, is it really worth fighting about? I think politics, we're not going to get too much into it. But I think politics can kind of do the same thing. Like, it's good to stand on truth, like what you believe in. That is important. Voting your values, all that. But sometimes I feel like our passions can sometimes, like, overshadow what God has called us to do when it comes to just loving people. We look at somebody who we disagree with, and we don't understand their perspective, so therefore we just get upset with where they are. And we get ticked off, and we forget about the whole grand scheme of things of how we're supposed to actually just... Love people. That's what God has called us to do, right? Um, recently, like, I'm just going to throw this out there. Husbands, um, actually, maybe the question is more for the wives. Do you ever feel like sometimes your husbands just sort of miss what's going on? They've missed the perspective. They've missed, like, like what you're doing and, and, and all this stuff. Here's an example. I, uh, last week was a super busy week for me. And come Sunday... Part of me, I just kind of wanted to just sort of relax a little bit. Now, my wife is amazing. Like, 
for those of you who know my wife, right? She's awesome. Yeah, give it up for my wife. Yeah. Now, now, we had planned a camping trip where we were just going to get away last Saturday through Monday. And now check this out. Mel made the reservations. She packed the camper. She got all the food, did all the shopping. She drove us there. And I get there, and I'm just like super grumpy gills, like because I just want to be at home in bed. Like I don't want to be camping right now. I just want to be home. I missed what she was doing there. Because her whole intention of us going out was to spend time as a family. To just get away from the frustrations and the stress and to just kind of decompress a little bit out there in wilderness and to just enjoy time together as a family. But I was so tunnel visioned and ticked off because I was tired that I just kind of made the whole trip sort of miserable. Wives, have, have, have your husbands ever done anything like that before? No, no. I'm seeing the husband's like, nope, nope. Well, I have, all right? And it's horrible. But you understand what I'm saying, right? It's so easy to, like, sweat the small stuff. Like so many of us, you know, we have kids just involved in making decisions that are just not great. I remember years ago I I had had... um, some parents come to me and talk to me about a decision that, that their kids were making. That, yes, it was a um, non-biblical decision. It was against Scripture what, this, uh, what their kids were doing. And so the question was, what are we supposed to do with our kids? Like, like we want to draw this line. We want to stand for truth. And we just want to make sure that we're not compromising. And when we, you know, so it was just this really kind of hard decision for them. And for me, the only advice that I could give was, just love them through it. Like, that's what we have to do, right? Because that ultimately is our call, right? To love people. We need to stand on truth. We, I am not saying at all that we compromise that. But when in doubt, when you don't know what to do, what, what, what um, decisions to make, know that standing with somebody, loving them through what they're going through, that's what matters. Jesus gives, this, gives us this whole other perspective here in Matthew 5. So if you want to check this out. Jesus says, and again, this is again about changing our perspective. He says, have you heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth? But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you. Do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Talk about a change of perspective, right? Like, be honest with me, all right? Just be honest. Not with me, with yourself, actually. Somebody punches you in the face. You're going to want to punch it back, right? Right. It's human nature. Let's say you're okay with loaning something to somebody, but then they never really gave back what you loaned. And then they come back and they want to borrow something again. Heck no, man. Right? Like, this is, this rocks our world. Jesus says, if somebody compels you to walk a mile, nope, we're going to. Here we go. Like, you go the distance. You do whatever it takes. Like, not for your own pride. Not for your own comfort or preference or any of that. Like, you go that extra mile in order to show that you love them. Even if they've mistreated you. You go that extra mile to show the love of Christ. Because in reality, God cares for both, right? That's what I read right there. It's not just the righteous. It's not just for people who are in the church. It's people who are out of the church. He loves them equally as much. So when we understand that making disciples is all a part of the plan, 
God's plan for our lives. And that we need, we need to do this at whatever place we are, wherever he puts us in life, you can do it. You can reach out to those around you. So whatever place you are, we're still called to make disciples. And we need to do it with the perspective of God, this 12,000 feet perspective as we look out around us. I want to read a story here to you real quick. How many of you guys have ever heard of Josh McDowell? Josh McDowell. For those of you who have never heard of Josh McDowell, um, he was kind of an important figure within uh, the Christian context, uh, culture. For many years, back in the early 60s, he, he didn't believe in God. He was, he was an agnostic. And somewhere along the way, somebody had challenged him and said, okay, prove that Christianity is not true. If you prove it, then okay, then, then, then you're good where you stand. And so what he decided to do is he, he looked at all the evidence and did some research and concluded that this actually makes sense. Not only does it make sense, I mean, it's right. This is the way to go. And so he ended up giving his life to Christ. He went on and be a part of a Campus Crusade for Christ, um, which is an international ministry on college campuses and, school, and at schools. Um, he went on to write over 150 books, and he was a speaker. And so from about the, the 70s through the 80s, 90s, he was a big deal. He wrote books like uh, More Than a Carpenter and Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And so this guy was around for a long time and had a huge impact on so many people's lives. And uh, his son, Sean, now has kind of followed suit. He's a pastor, he's a writer, he's a speaker. And Sean shares this story about his dad um, in his book. He says, Dad, I'm not sure if I believe in Christianity. I want to know what is true, but I have a lot of questions. What would you say if your son or daughter spoke these words to you? Just stop for a second. And you think that. What would you say if your son or daughter said that to you? How would you respond if these words came from a young Christian you deeply cared about? He goes on to say, well, as a 19-year-old college student, I spoke these words to my father, not knowing how he would respond, especially since I was questioning the very message he has committed his life to proclaiming. And yet I will never forget my father's confident response. Son, I am glad to see you exploring your faith seriously because you cannot live on my convictions. You have to know for sure what you think is true. If you genuinely seek truth, I am confident you will follow Jesus because he is truth. Only walk away from what you have learned growing up if you conclude it is false. Now check this. And know that your mother and I love you no matter what you believe. That's pretty good, right? Like think about his reputation, Josh McDowell, like, had his son just completely walked away and become an atheist or agnostic like he was? Like, all the ridicule that he could have gotten from other Christians, like, here you are telling us how, how we're supposed to disciple and, 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 and talking about salvation when your own kid here, he's not even walking this way. He threw all of that out the window, reputation and all, and said, you know what? We're going to love you regardless. And so, so many times I think that we need to make sure that we're not getting caught up in the small stuff. That we have God's perspective of the bigger picture. He knows what's going on. I know sometimes a lot of our kids, we were there, we made bonehead decisions, right? We make decisions that aren't great for our lives. Hang in there. Love them through it. I believe that's what you're called to do. You can't convince them of the truth. You can do your best. But I'm telling you right now that if you love them through that, even people in your your coworkers, people you work with, you hear them making decisions and crazy plans for the weekend or something, you know, whatever, and you just, your heart just kind of breaks, and sometimes we can get a little prideful and a little judgmental. No, love them through it. Love them through it because that's God's perspective. Finally, I want to talk about the fourth one, which is the passion for the lost. Now, how many of you, if you saw somebody drowning, if you're on a boat, you saw somebody drowning, you had one of those life rings, you would throw that out there to them, right? How many of you would do that? You would, right? Because we're not going boating at all if you're not. All right. Okay. Just to make sure you would respond that way. All right. So I really believe that we do have that, that little life ring. What do they call it? A lifesaver? That's the candy, right? I don't know. We'll call it a life ring device. Yeah. All right. 
So I believe that we have that in Jesus. Like we know, we know the truth. We know who Jesus is. We know what he's done in our lives. We know what salvation can bring. We know the healing and the help that he brings in our life. We, we, we get all that. We know that, what he can do. And there's so many people yet around us that I wonder if sometimes we're just too tunnel focused to do anything about that. We're too kind of caught up in our own thing. Because there is a world that's around us that we are called to reach out to, to bring in the salvation, to plant seeds, if nothing else. And I just wanted to kind of share some stuff here with you um, in order to sort of kind of set the tone a little bit and, and not to really necessarily get you angry, but to sort of break your heart a little bit about the condition of where we are in our society. Um, I absolutely love, I, I get the opportunity to, to work with many of your, your kids and grandkids in the youth ministry, and I absolutely love it, and it's such a privilege and an honor. You have some amazing kids and grandkids. Um, you've done a great job raising them. Um, but for those kids who are here, I don't know if you know this, but it's, it's kind of not the norm for the, their generation. They say that Generation Z, so that's, that's those who were, who were born from 1995 to about 2015 or so, so they would put them somewhere between 9 to 23 years old, 24 years old. That's Gen Z. We're no longer talking about millennials. Millennials are out. They're kind of doing their thing. But right now what researchers are saying is focus on Gen Z because this is an important generation to focus on. But let's understand where they are. They say this is the first post-Christian generation to ever exist. Post-Christian meaning that most of them were not raised in the church. They were not raised with Christian values. They don't know who Jesus is. And so um, when we look at biblical, uh, biblical literacy, like there's so many who just don't know the Bible at all because they weren't raised in it. For every one person who comes to faith, four leave. Uh, there is what they call, it's actually like a, a religious sort of box, so to speak. They are called um, the nuns, which it is the largest growing sort of religious group here in America. Nuns not being habits and all that stuff. Nun being as an N-O-N-E-S, the nuns. Meaning that uh, when you fill out forms, uh, I don't even know what context you would fill out a form and you would put your religion on, but those forms, you know what they are. You've seen those. Um, what? Yeah, a hospital. There we go. Thank you, Mark. So you write those down, and then uh, often you'll see Christian, Muslim, Hindu. You see all these different religions, but there's always one box there that says none, meaning that you don't associate yourself with religion at all. That right now is the fastest growing religion here in the United States, those who are not affiliating themselves with any religion at all. In fact, just to kind of put this into perspective to, to help you know how fast this is growing, uh, back in 1930 to 40, there was only about 5% people in the United States that would mark that none category. Jump 50 years, 50 years, it jumps 3% to 8%. To 8%. From 1990 to 2008, it jumps 7% to 15% who would now consider themselves a nun. Now, four years later, it jumps 5% in 2012. If you go three years later, 23%. So what was seen in 50 years, a 3% raise in that, we've seen happen in the last three years, from 2012 to 2015, and it's continuing to grow. In fact, the Pew Research did a statistics where basically they boiled, boiled, boiled it all down and they said if the United States had 100 people in it, just 100, 25 of them would, be, would consider themselves Christians. Now Christianity is still that, that larger um, religious group here, although it's declining, but it's still considered the largest group. But if you took those 100 people, 25 would, would call themselves Christians, 23 would be the nuns. And again, as we see these those are decreasing and increasing. I hope that breaks your heart just a little bit. Not that it makes you mad or angry at this younger generation because it's not their fault. You can't blame this younger generation for living and doing what they're doing because many of them weren't raised in the church. They don't know the truth. There's also one thing that researchers have found is that 
atheists was kind of a, atheism was kind of a big deal. Obviously, still is, but um, atheism is is the the denying of God's existence. But there's this new thing that has kind of risen called apathyism, and apathyism is basically where you just don't care, you don't think about it, and so that's what many of the young people are considered. They're just apathyists, like. For what, somehow they're considered still very spiritual, open to spirituality, open to, to, to a God that he does exist, but not willing to really check the box on any one religion. Certainly not Christianity. And so they're apathetic to, what, to whether or not there is a God. And so I want to read Luke 15, and we're going to go through much of this chapter and I, if you're familiar with this, you can even, as we get reading, you realize what it is, you can even stop. But I, I want you to just listen, though. Read along with me or just listen to the language that Jesus uses here. He's going to talk about three different scenarios, lost sheep, lost coin, and a lost son. And I want you to just listen to Jesus' passion that he has for the lost. And then we're going to close. Starting verse 1 of Luke 15. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts, in, puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. He goes on, verse 8. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Verse 11. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got, to, the son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to, to a citizen of that country who sent him to his field to feed pigs. He longed to feed his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his fingers and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Do you hear that? The passion for the lost. It is God's plan that we all are a part of going out and sharing the gospel. Sharing love with those who are in our neighborhoods, who are in our schools, who are in the cubicle right across the hall. We are called to do that in the place in which he has put us. Not that we compare ourselves with what other people have or what other people are doing, but that we're faithful with what we've been given. That's what matters. 
and that we have the right perspective. It's easy to kind of pull back and just, just, just get so caught up in all of the mess and the routine of life. To be so easily offended because somebody doesn't believe the same way I believe, vote the same way that I vote, think the same way that I think. Because God's perspective is that, no, we're, it's a bigger perspective that sees everything. And we are called to love, not to get caught up in the small stuff. Even though it may seem important for the moment, we need to understand the bigger picture. And maybe above all, we just need to have that passion for the lost. Because there are people all around us who are sinking, who need saved. Colossians 3 says this. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Would you join me as we pray?